And today we're going to be talking to Professor Rudy Turning from the uh, law faculty at the University of Calgary. And we're gonna be talking about small modular nuclear reactors, something that I don't know enough about and I'm looking forward to being educated as I know you are. So welcome to the, uh, the interview, Rudy. Mark, and thank you very much for having me. Good to talk to you. Now, you wrote a very interesting article in the Ablog, which is uh, where the uh, law professors uh, blog these days, and yes. about SMRs. And uh, I'm very interested because last year, the federal government put out a report by Generation Energy, and the section of that uh, dealt with uh, cleaning up oil and gas production, basically decarbonizing and lowering emissions in the, uh, El primarily the Alberta oil and gas sector. And it was suggested in just, little, just one paragraph that SMRs might be a key part of electrifying oil and gas production. So that really caught my attention, but I don't know enough about SMRs. Can you give us an introduction, an overview to small modular nuclear reactors? Absolutely. Well, the starting position um, of SMRs is that um, we're drawing upon a, a long history of using uh, the nuclear fission for purposes of generating energy or electricity, uh, which dates back right to the 1960s when the US Army Corps initially sort of looked at these um, for purposes of putting small nuclear reactors on barges for military operations. Uh, and then the history is sort of, you know, um, uh, involved SMR sort of falling behind and, and, and the focus was on large nuclear power generation. And um, they, they form part, uh, you know, for a long time in the um, Russian um, or Soviet rather um, icebreaker fleets. Uh, and post uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the uh, Russian uh, focus was very much on looking at um, small modular reactors uh, for purposes of, sort of rebuilding uh, the former days of um, the, the, the nuclear um, energy engineering. Uh, so SMRs, uh, the way that I started getting involved with them was um, uh, from an ag academic perspective, looking at uh, floating nuclear power plants uh, that subsequently have been sort of rebranded as part of the SMR um, cl club, so to speak. So these are, in, in, in a sense, smaller nuclear power plants that are put on barges and, and located to strategic um, uh, located in strategic destinations where there is no other way of generating electricity, heat or electricity. So these, the, an SMR is essentially uh, just a small nuclear plant. Is there any other design elements or anything uh, particularly unique about them? What makes them unique is that the whole business model of SMRs is geared towards manufacturing them uh, as, as, as um, modules and in one location from which they get dispatched and to where they ultimately will return for purposes of taking out the, the spent fuel, uh, re refurbishment, uh, refueling, etc. And so the whole idea is, and this is where the modular part comes in, the, the whole idea is that you could technically, almost like sort of a Lego brick analogy, start off with one, um, see what your energy needs are, add on another two or three or more, uh, and then depending on the energy needs of, of your project or the community or a desalination plant or whatever, you know, mining project that needs um, electricity support, uh, you're able to add on or take away from those. And this is what makes the business model of the SMR so interesting because the whole purpose of SMRs is not unlike their larger counterparts, um, uh, 30, 40, 50 year project spans, but typically about 10 to 15 years. And that makes them very, very interesting for the purposes of even the discussion um, of an energy transition, where, for example, you could say as a policy maker that, um, you know, by the time that we build up our renewables, uh, non-hydro, so, uh, solar and wind, for example, capacity, we need something in between. And so the way that I've looked at them very much uh, as an opportunity is as significant contributors to the energy transition to in many ways facilitate the deployment of the renewables in parallel to them. So a really good example um, in, in about the early 2010s was the uh, question of whether or not uh, the Kingdom of Georgia, uh, Jordan needed to um, build up 
uh, power generation for purposes of desalination infrastructure. And uh, there was a very, very serious discussion about having one of these floating nuclear power plants slash SMRs for those purposes. So Markham, that's, that's very much kind of where they fit into. That's very much kind of what their objective will be. Excellent. Now, um, I uh, use levelized cost of energy studies like Lazard and the EIA uh, fairly regularly. And the last time I checked the Lazard LCOE, a small modular nuclear reactor is uh, the price of electricity was very high compared to renewables, even, you know, gas and coal. Uh, is that still the case? Or what's your take on that? I, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable commenting on the economics of it, but I will, I will go as far as saying the following. Uh, the, the, the starting position is that these SMRs are something that are currently being developed. We don't have them as yet. The plan in Canada is to try and have a, a small modular reactor for, for purposes of um, studies and, and, and marketing in many ways by, by 2025, 2030. We'll have to see if those targets are realistic. So the starting position is we don't as yet have them. So a lot of the cost that you're alluding to, I would imagine is related to the development uh, to the regulatory aspects, and that's something that I like to address in a moment, if I may, uh, and to the whole idea of deploying these um, modular reactors really for the first time. And so they, so they fall into this, this sort of um, world uh, of first of a kind, and that makes it really, really interesting from a legal and regulatory perspective. Well, let's talk about regulatory perspective. Um, as a child of the 70s, uh, I remember some of the concerns, you know, Love Canal and, and Three Mile Island and so on. Uh, and so I, we, we, in my uh, perspective, uh, I always associate nuclear reactors with waste, and waste is a problem. So is that a big part of the, the nuclear conundrum, or the regulatory conundrum, if, if, I, if I could describe it like that? Absolutely. I mean, you know, these, these SMRs will be fueled by um, nuclear fuel, um, uranium-based, uh, at least at the moment. Um, and ultimately, there will be a question of the nuclear waste. Now, um, the, the reality in Canada is that um, we have a significant amount of generation of electricity out east from nuclear. And Canada is currently, the regulator in Canada is currently grappling with this question of what are we going to do with this long-term question of waste. So I fully recognize that any discussion involving SMRs will immediately raise implications of, well, do we need to add more nuclear fuel to spent nuclear fuel to the nuclear waste pile than we already have. And that is something definitely that is, is, is of, of concern um, and, and recognized concern, acceptable concern um, to, to take into account. The, the way the engineering part of these SMRs, to my understanding, involves burning up a large amount of the fuel so that really by the time that they come to the end of their project life cycle, there is not that much um, fuel left, and that, that sort of immediately reduces some of the safety and security concerns, but the question of the waste is definitely something that needs to be considered. So, you know, just for the purposes of, of those interested in nuclear, I mean, the question of a deep, a deep geological repository in Canada, for example, is something that the, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is currently looking into uh, as, a way, as part of the Nuclear Waste Management Organization plan as well. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, I had uh, I watched a few videos, did a bit of research on thorium reactors, molten mm -hmm. salt reactors, uh, advanced, and I gather there's advanced nuclear designs mm -hmm. as well, which I'm not that familiar with. Uh, are any of those technologies close enough to development? And maybe you could describe what uh, thorium and molten salt are. And are any of those technologies within reach uh, in the foreseeable future? So my understanding is, uh, and again, from an engineering point of view, I'm going to defer to, to the experts on thorium, but my understanding is that there has been uh, quite a lot of research into thorium as an alternative fuel for the purposes of these SMRs. Um, my understanding is that um, the U.S. is looking at it uh, in particular as well. Um, whether or not it's going to be something that's going to be part of the option, um, I don't know, but I would certainly welcome and encourage any any sort of question of diversification of fuel sources. The, the key advantage of thor thorium is that it has a much um, shorter um, lifespan in many ways for purposes of the um, nuclear um, 
energy, so to speak. So it would be definitely something to consider in terms of the waste question as well. Now, of course, one of the, the energy transition from my point of view is basically we electrify everything, or at least uh, right now the primary energy, uh, fossil fuels make up uh, most of the primary energy on the, in, the, in the global economy, about 82%. And let's say 80% for sake of argument, and uh, renewables make up, or electricity generated by hydro and so on, make up around 20%. And over time, my guess is that'll flip. We'll probably use some fossil fuels uh, off in the future. But we are electrifying the global economy. Industry, buildings, uh, transportation, transportation, all going to be electrified. We need tremendous amounts of electricity, and I know this is a, within the, the energy transition community. This is a burning question. How do we get enough electricity to electrify things in a hurry? And there do, doesn't seem to be many options. What's your take on the contribution of uh, nuclear and SMRs to that quicker electrification? Well, look, the reality is, and, and maybe just putting SMRs a little bit into context, um, um, we have very ambitious uh, decarbonization um, uh, objectives um, globally. I'm talking about the Paris Agreement. We have very ambitious um, sustainable development goals that are really looking at the global question of uh, decarbonizing economies, but at the same time, and this is the emphasis, ensuring energy access for all, for example, um, fighting climate change, finding alternative sources of energy so that the traditional uh, fossil fuels, in particular coal, are displaced. But the question is, with what? And the, the challenge, and maybe I could take this as an opportunity to come back to, to, to Canada and, and perhaps also to Alberta for a moment. Um, the challenge really is that we are not going to be able to rely solely on renewables for the purposes of displacing current fossil fuel consumption and managing at the same time way of satisfying the energy demand that is that is happening around the world and i'm talking about electrification um, i'm talking emerging economies i'm talking about energy transitions as you just alluded to so the fundamental question here is what role does nuclear have to play in this question of energy access to for all and uh, the director general of the International um, Atomic Energy Agency at, at COP25 just, uh, just uh, raised this point recently. Nuclear has a large role to play in order to meet some of the energy, in order to meet the energy demand of the International Energy Agency, all the other uh, big uh, you know, uh, commentators in many ways have identified nuclear will play an absolutely fundamental role. And then you have this question of, okay, if we, if we recognize that we need, need nuclear for the purposes of um, meeting this energy demand, facilitating this electrification of industry, of transportation, of cities, of the way that we produce our food, the way that we deal with our natural resources, extract our natural resources, the way that we transport goods around the world, et cetera, et cetera. Then the fundamental question is, okay, what kind of nuclear do we want to have? Do we want to focus on the large scale tradition nuclear power plants that usually have about 1,000 to 1,500 megawatts in terms of capacity? Or are we going to be looking at something smaller? Uh, and and, and that, that's the opportunity, in my opinion at least, for small modular reactors. So then you look at, you look at the um, sort of the, the uh, proof or the evidence of developing new nuclear power plants around the world, and two projects really come to mind. One is the nuclear power plant in Finland. One is the Hinkley Point in the UK. Those projects are going ahead. They will certainly make a significant contribution to generating electricity in those particular jurisdictions, but they have been significantly delayed. And with delay come cost explosions. So every time you have one of those examples of these large nuclear power projects um, being delayed and, and with significant costs, you also have to ask yourself the question, well, what could be the alternative be? And I would argue very strongly that the alternative would be small modular reactors that are based on a single prototype that is then replicated. And that's the fundamental difference to this idea of these large power plants, which are very much one of a kind every single time. Let's bring this back to Alberta in a very tangible way. So the oil sands make up 80% of Alberta oil production. Uh, while newer projects certainly have much lower emissions and lower carbon intensity 
per barrel. That's maybe competitive with some of the US crude oil. It's still true that it's a carbon intense product. And in order to be competitive in a low carbon future, the oil sands companies understand explicitly that they need to lower that carbon intensity. And it seems to me that there are technologies, for instance, on the SAG-D side, steam assisted gravity drainage, there are, there's a one technology, for instance, I'll be interviewing the company next week, that they have an electric heater that basically, mm -hmm. for simplicity's sake, you put it down hole and microwave the reservoir and it, it, it melts the bitumen and then you can extract mm -hmm. it. But you need cheap, lots of cheap electricity to do that. And in the short term, small SMRs would seem to be a very logical way to do that. And if you applied that to the rest of the industry, that's a lot of electricity and SMRs then could, you know, that could be part of the solution. What's your take on that? Well, look, the key emphasis um, is on the question of electricity. How can we get not only cheap electricity, but reliable electricity? And um, I'm going to uh, use this as an opportunity to comment on the development of renewable, uh, non-hydro renewables, wind and solar in Alberta. Now, the starting position, and this is exactly the same in Germany in terms of the energy energy transition there, for example, uh, that, I, that I can draw upon if you like. But the question in Alberta is, where do we generate the renewables, non-hydro renewables? Where are the key centers of consumption of the electricity? Where's the electricity need? And there you immediately have a discord between where the oil sands industry, in many ways, if you want to call it loosely, is located and where the majority of Alberta's potential to develop wind energy in particular is. You have a north-south divide. Now, when you have such a divide, and it's exactly the same in terms of the offshore wind energy industry in Germany and the key centers of demand in the, in the middle and the south of the country, um, the question then is, okay, well, we need significant electricity transmission infrastructure that's costly, that has environmental um, land use implications. And the question then is, do we really want to do that? Or can we start looking at alternatives in the industry, such as SMRs, that would allow the industry to significantly decarbonize their production processes. And SMRs, in my opinion at least, are definitely something that need to be part of the conversation. Historically, there was a discussion in Alberta, to my understanding, um, in the late 90s to develop a nuclear power plant, a large scale nuclear power plant, for that very reason. Um, it didn't go ahead because of, I think, to my understanding at least, because of economics, and because of political opposition. Um, but the question is, is there an opportunity for small modular reactors, given what I said initially, in terms of their relatively short-term use, in terms of their relative mobility, um, and in terms of their opportunity, that, in terms of the opportunity they bring to generate cheap, clean electricity that would support industry projects? And that, that's exactly what, um, you know, for example, going back to this floating nuclear power, uh, power plant that I talked about um, that's been deployed to the academic Lomonov in Russia is exactly for that very purpose. It's to support natural resources projects for a certain amount of time. And so that makes it really kind of interesting in terms of pros for the SMRs, because as part of the dialogue that you would have about them, you would be able to say, uh, this is not a nuclear power plant that's going to be in your backyard, so to speak, for 40 or 50 years. It generates gigantic, gigantic amounts of nuclear waste that have to be dealt with. But these are smaller modular reactors that can be tailored to the needs of the industry, um, depending on the project duration, in order to basically generate, in order to generate clean and cheap electricity. So I would, to answer your question in a very academic way, uh, say that you know there is definitely a potential and it should be part of the conversation and I and I believe it already is part of the conversation for purposes of looking at the way that the Alberta oil and gas industry um, produces um, and, and a way of aggressively decarbonizing that production process using small modular reactors. Rudy, thank you very much for this. This is a fascinating discussion. I think we've, uh, we've only uh, just scratched the surface of it. I'm yeah. sure we'll come back to this and have uh, more more conversations about this topic. We look forward to it. Thank you very much for this. I would look, I look forward to coming back and discussing the regulatory process around these uh, SMRs with you further, Mark. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you.